General, you can begin making your way down. Hey, General, how are you? Hey, Michael. General, I'll give you a second to get settled in, and uh, you've been back there, so I know you know the, the routine, but with the status quo recommended budget, if you can just uh, articulate what that entails for the operations of your department, and just for the viewing audience, just provide a brief synopsis of the services that you provide for the city, and the floor is yours. My name is Glenn Funk. I'm the district attorney in Nashville. I have with me tonight Michael Brook. Michael has been the CFO for the DA's office since 1981. Uh, he was hired by District Attorney Thomas Shriver, served the entire tenure of Tory Johnson. I've been fortunate enough to uh, have him serve in our office for the four years that I've been DA. His wisdom and institutional knowledge have been very valuable for the office and for the city and I really think that he is one of Nashville's greatest natural resources. Um, and he can also answer uh, some of the specific questions uh, to the dollar on some of the questions that you might have tonight. Uh, as far as what our office does, the first duty of government is public safety. And the DA's office represents the people of the state of Tennessee, the people of Davidson County, and especially victims, as well as society at large, in criminal in criminal cases. Uh, we have roughly 80,000 criminal charges taken out in Davidson County. Uh, our job is not only uh, one of the most important jobs in the criminal justice system or in, in national government, but it's also one of the toughest. We have 11 general sessions judges, and so each one of them listens to 1 11th of the cases that come through the system. We have six criminal court judges, and so each one of those hears one-sixth of the cases that are indicted. Our public defender's office uh, represents 25 to 30 percent of the charges that come through, but the district attorney's office handles 100 percent of the cases that come through. And we do that with a staff of 70 attorneys. We handle cases from uh, revoked driver's license all the way up to mass shootings. And our job really is to keep the community safe, with the way that we represent uh, the state of Tennessee in each of these cases, we look at victim support, uh, talk to victims, figure out how they were hurt, ask them, get some input from them, and what do they need to be supported to where uh, they can get beyond this incident in their life and, uh, and be as close to whole as they were before a violent crime was uh, committed upon them. We also try to make sure that the community is healthy. That's why uh, some substance abuse cases that come through the system might not be handled with, uh, with incarceration, but instead try to direct those folks into treatment to where they can have support uh, to beat addiction problems. That's why mental health uh, cases oftentimes lead to treatment. Real excited about the uh, sheriff's mental health facility that's being constructed right now, and I've been working with public defender uh, Don Diener Look forward to working with Ms. Johnson as well when she takes off September 1st, and the police chief as well as the sheriff try to make sure that we properly support those individuals in our community that have mental health issues and try to divert them out of the system if it's not a violent crime. Uh, we also focus on fairness and public trust because I think it's important for a community to understand that the criminal justice system uh, is fair, fair to uh, everyone, no matter what part of town they live in, if they're a victim, and fair if they end up being a defendant in a case that they're gonna be treated the same way uh, as, as other folks that come through the system. It's important to humanize everybody that touches the system, whether they're victim or defendant alike. Uh, in Davidson County, violent crime's up. 
there's a proliferation of guns. We have uh, some increases in some of the gun offenses for youthful uh, offenders. Uh, we have been working to do a couple of things to try to get at those issues both through the juvenile court and in the adult court with regards to uh, if you're charged with a gun offense in adult court then we try to either make sure that the person is going to a class called violence interrupted where we try to get at the root causes of why people think that they need to go armed if you think you need to go armed for your own personal protection then maybe you are uh, running with the wrong crowd um, and then uh, also trying to make sure that uh, the system treats those cases seriously enough to where sometimes incarceration, even though that is a severe sanction, that is appropriate if it is a gun offense. Uh, we've also been working in the area of elder abuse. Uh, Councilman Schulman has led a statewide effort with regards to the reform of elder abuse laws and our office has been working with the legislature as well. We have some new elder abuse laws that I think properly support and protect vulnerable and elderly adults. Um, in the last year, in 2017, we had 1,290 referrals to a VAPID team, a vulnerable, uh, a vulnerable adult prosecution and investigation team. Um, of those 1,290 referrals, five to 10% of those uh, referrals turned into actual criminal court cases. And those are uh, basically fall in three areas, either physical abuse, financial abuse, or, or sexual exploitation. Uh, and uh, with that increase uh, of looking at those, at those incidents, uh, I think we're gonna be able to better support the elderly, which is the uh, largest growing segment of our, of our community, largest demographic. Um, Ms. Diener talked about the 75% rule and she is 100% correct. That is a state law and increases in our budget do have to be matched by a 75% increase in the public defender's budget. Uh, I will point out that the current metro budget, what we give to the public defender's office is eight and a half million dollars, whereas the district attorney's office gets from the metro government $7.2 million. We are funding them at $1.3 million higher. Now, our overall budget is significantly higher because the state uh, funds us at about 7.8 to $7.9 million, so our total budget is roughly $15 million. They are woefully underfunded, and I look forward to working with our new public defender to try to get uh, more state dollars into the public defender's office here in Davidson County. But as far as Metro's responsibilities, uh, we are receiving $1.3 million less from the Metro Treasury for our important work and our handling of all the cases. Um, I want to uh, kind of end my opening remarks with discussions about salaries. St at the assistant district attorneys, those 70 lawyers that work in the district attorney's office, get paid uh, under a state uh, statute that says how much each one of those assistant DAs can be paid. In the Metro Public Defender's Office, those lawyers get paid uh, a significant amount more than district attorneys. For a long time, public defenders were paid less and this body worked very hard in the early 2000s to get their pay up to the same as the pay that district attorneys were being made, were being paid. In most other jurisdictions in the country, it's rough pay parity between the two institutions, public defenders and district attorneys. Some district attorneys get paid more. Uh, we are the only jurisdiction in the country where lawyers whose charge and mission is to protect the safety of the community get paid less than lawyers whose charge it is to represent citizens who are accused of crime. Currently, if I were to hire someone who is fresh out of law school, that person would make $49,000 from the state treasury versus $63,000 that the Metro pays for folks that are right out of law school that are joining the public defender's office. I came to this body last year and I asked for essentially a $10,000 supplement of Metro funds for starting district attorneys. 
And the council tried to do that. In fact, I think this council was ready to vote that entire amount, but because of the 75% rule, what you were told and what I was told was, we're gonna have to do this in two bites. We're gonna have to pay $5,000 this year and we'll get it up to the $10,000 mark next year. Um, and so we are very appreciative of what you did last year and we are very hopeful that even though the mayor did not include that in in the budget that has been submitted that this council will once again say that it is important to us to try to properly fund the district attorneys and make sure that the assistant DA salaries are appropriate with regards to uh, how they compare with uh, public defenders and other government lawyers. Uh, it's important because it's fair. It's important because I need for public safety reasons to recruit and retain the best lawyers in the city to be serving in the district attorney's office. We need for the best law firm in the state to be the Nashville district attorney's office. We have great people there. I think we are the best law firm in the state, but we need to keep it that way. And one of the ways that we need to do that is to make sure that district attorneys who are working in our office uh, are getting a compensation that is roughly equal with the public defenders. They would still start even at state plus 10 at roughly $4,000 less, but over the course of their careers, it would pretty much work out because of certain steps that are built into the assistant DA salaries. And then the other thing that, that would, would make this important is that uh, while the state legislature thinks that all assistant DAs uh, have a certain it, it, appropriate uh, amount of pay, it's a whole lot more expensive to live in Nashville than it is to live in Polk County. And if I'm gonna be able to recruit great lawyers to live in this community, there needs to be some sort of local salary adjustment. We appreciate the five, but we're really hoping that in this year's budget, y'all can find a way to properly fund this at the state plus 10 that uh, I asked for last year and that y'all committed to last year. Uh, now, uh, with that, those are my remarks and I'm available to take any questions. Thank you so much, General. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. Uh, General, you're exactly right. We, we talked about this and last year, I do believe, I don't wanna speak on behalf of the entire council, but I do believe that we were trying to go ahead and equalize it last year um, due to what we were told we couldn't. Uh, but we clearly said at that point that we wanted to equalize you this year. And it was my understanding, and I just wanna clarify this, it was my understanding that if we did it, in, and I'll call it two bites or however you want to, two chunks, however you want to, you want to say it, um, then it would not trigger anything on the 75% this year because we have done a part of it last year and so therefore it kept you under the threshold. Am I saying that correctly? Th that was my understanding of the explanation that came from Metro Legal, that because of certain <clears throat> automatic uh, increases that were coming in Metro's funding for the public defenders that if we came back this year then we would stay underneath that underneath the cap to where their increases would roughly equal the 75 percent to where we could get the what would at this point be four hundred and two thousand dollars which would be five thousand dollars per assistant DA and then the extra would cover the FICA and the contribution to the retirement plan so it's 402 but but do, what is the what's the total number total is 402 it is 402 the total, to, total additional this year above last year is 402 okay and that you said that has the, that has the fight that has everything built into it yes sir okay and so then at that point and then it equalizes you uh well within as you said but over over the course of a uh, the career then it, it evens itself out. That's correct. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just, I'll close with this, this statement. When we give our word on something, I think that's pretty important. Uh, last year, there were several of us who warned of some of the things that we were, we were working towards and what we were doing. Um, this, in my opinion, is another area that's important. If public safety is truly going to be a key thing that, that is going to be a priority for our city, then I've always believed in that as, as, as with education. And so we're gonna to have to make some hard decisions, um, but I feel like that under the leadership that we have, uh, and if we really put our, roll our sleeves up and do what we need to do, we're gonna try, I personally, I'm gonna try my best to get there because you're right, we did tell you that we were gonna do it uh, that way because that's the way we were told we could, that was the only way we could do it is, our, again, my understanding uh, I'm certainly not an attorney, 
but um, that was the understanding I had, and so uh, that's my commitment because, uh, you know, we, we got you part of the way there last year. We need to finish the job this year. I appreciate your efforts, and thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Glover. Councilman Cooper. Um, thank you, just so that we're all dealing with the same set of facts and having um, been quite a bit of time on this last year. Our current interpretation is that 402,000 for you does not require an offset to the public defender's office. That's not your understanding. So, so if, um, so under some interpretations that would still be then uh, requiring 75% of that to the public defender's office. Um, I really right, think you, you need to take this back to either Mr. Jameson or Metro Legal for that. I wouldn't want to be in the position of <laughs> Councilman Cooper, a legal what we're question. Doing, we, we, will, we will yield that okay. to, to legal well, to make sure. We, there was a baked understanding of this last <laughs> June, and I just want to go back to everybody's exact uh, interpretation. I do, I do know that um, uh, the public defender's office was, there was a complicated set of trade-offs where we did not get there for you last year, as we promised we were trying to do that due to this other budget constraint. Um, separate from that, would you speak to us a little bit about the rise in violent crime in Nashville, the kind of the statistics, uh, our rates of violence crime and how um, we really have a much bigger problem, I think, than the whole community is aware of. Parts of the community, as you know, are deeply aware of this. But if you would just give us some facts and figures to understand it better. Um, we have seen a large increase in, in, in violent crime, in particular gun offenses and shootings. Three years ago, the state legislature passed a law that said that our cars are an extension of our house, which made it legal for even folks who do not have carry permits to have a gun in their car. Prior to that, if a police officer stopped a motorist and saw the butt of a gun sticking out and the person was not, uh, uh, did not have a carry permit, they could seize the weapon and arrest the person for carrying a weapon. Now the police department can no longer do that. Uh, under under state law. It's not only, a, uh, I mean, it is a real problem for police officers who are in tense situations and it's an officer safety issue because if they're stopping more people with more guns and cannot seize the weapon right away, that puts them in a uh, dangerous situation. But it's also something that can lead to more gun violence because more people armed means there's going to be more gun violence because sometimes arguments get out of control and if there is a deadly weapon right there then deadly weapons oftentimes get used another issue that we are seeing with regards to that is many times members of our community that carry guns in their car uh, sometimes act in careless and irresponsible ways and by that i mean when they have a gun in their car and they get home they don't get the gun and carry it inside and lock it up. They instead leave it in their car and then if the car is left unlocked, individuals will just try door, door handles in apartment parking lots and when one's open then they look around and if there's a gun in there then they're gonna take the gun and sometimes, one time tragically this year already, a, a young person horseplay with a gun that they had gotten out of an unlocked car shot and killed one of their friends. Um, it's, it's a real tragedy. It's something where I think as a community what we really need to do is reaffirm our the fact that we believe in a sanctity of life, that we try to make sure people understand the permanence of death, that people understand the dangerousness of deadly weapons, not just guns, but knives, other types of weapons, and we need to uh, really be thinking what we're, about what we're doing and you know one of the ways is through education and one of the ways is through uh, a, a law enforcement, our office and the police department trying to get in front of the problem instead of uh, just always being reactive. Uh, one of the ways this has manifested itself is for a number of years our homicide rate declined. In the 1990s uh, the homicide rate had leveled off at roughly 100 homicides per year. Those numbers dropped 
all the way through 2014 was the low number. It got down into the mid, low to mid 40s. What were the reasons for that? Well, uh, I think one of the main reasons probably was an increase in improvement in medicine to where somebody who was shot in 1989 might not survive, but the same injuries in 2014, uh, better medicine would have saved that person's life and what would have been a homicide is now an aggravated assault. Um, but those numbers have continued to climb and we are on the verge of hitting that 100 homicide number again. Uh, what we think needs to happen is uh, besides all those initiatives on the front end to try to slow down the rate of violence, but on the back end when we're being reactive, we take those cases very, very seriously. I mean, that's, that's, that's why we build our prisons is to incapacitate folks who are a real danger to personal safety. And so we uh, take those homicide cases very seriously uh, and, and try to make sure that whether it's a shooting, whether it's a homicide, whatever, that those are the cases that we are trying to spend most of our resources on, which is why, you know, as we have dealt with drug abuse issues or mental health issues, we can do that and try to divert some of those folks out of the system. That leaves us the time to spend the proper amount of time on cases of violent crime, and that's where we're trying to put the resources of the community. Thank you, Councilman Cooper. Seeing no other council members seeking recognition, thank you so much, General. And that concludes um, our budget hearings for today. I want to thank uh, the Budget and Finance uh, Committee members, as always, my outstanding vice chair, and also council members as well, and Director Lomax O'Neill and council staff. And we are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.